Hello everyone and welcome again to a short stop with a short stop. Today we're going to talk about always be ready. There was an old teammate of mine, his, his name was Larry McWilliams. Um, he, got, he started off with the Atlanta Braves organization and got traded to the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, I started off with San Francisco and I ended up getting traded to the Pittsburgh Pirates. But Larry was a teammate of mine, but not only that, uh, he was a member of the church. And later on in life, he became an elder or a bishop or a shepherd at the Browns Trail Church of Christ in the Dallas-Fort Worth uh, area in Texas. On August 1st, 1978, uh, Larry was with the Atlanta Braves and Pete Rose had a 44-game hitting streak going. And the ballpark was basically sold out because the Reds were in town. Larry was the starting pitcher. And the Braves naturally wanted to stop his streak. Uh, 56 game hitting streak by Joe DiMaggio is the longest one that's, that's ever been and it's, it's stood for many, many years. It, Pete's first at bat, Pete smoked one right back up the middle. I mean, he smoked it. And uh, Larry caught it, a line drive. And Pete later, after the game was over, said, I do not know how he caught that ball. But if he doesn't catch it, Everybody knows that that ball was going to be a base hit and the hitting streak would have been kept alive. And Pete's next at bat against Larry, he smoked another one. <clears throat> and there was a runner on first base, his name was Dave Collins for the Reds. And he thought it was through and he kept going. He was going to try to uh, make it to third base. But Bob Horner, the third baseman, dove and caught it in the air and doubled Collins off of first. And company's third at bat, uh, it was Gene Garber had come in relief of uh, Larry McWilliams. And Garber ended up striking Pete Rose out. He's last at bat to stop the 40 game hit, 44 game hitting streak. But what I'm trying to tell you is those two pitchers were ready, especially Larry McWilliams. Uh, he was ready not only to pitch, but he was ready to catch line drives up the middle. Larry and I went on a mission trip with each other to Peru. Uh, we went into Lima and the first week that we were there, the first four days, there was a lectureship going on there. And Larry was not one of the speakers. Uh, he was just gonna sit and listen and then we were gonna go on to Inca, Peru and, and do some mission work there for a congregation that we helped support. But as the days drew on, the last day came up and Jack Farber said, uh, Larry, you need to speak. <laughs> and Larry didn't know what to say. And he looked at Jack and he said, okay. So next thing you know, Larry was up at the pulpit and did a 45 minute lesson that was absolutely awesome. Larry was ready. I went on my first mission trip that I ever went on. It was with Jack Farber. It was just me and him. We went to Panama, Panama City, Panama. And it was a baseball clinic. And I wasn't sure exactly what was going to go on or what we were going to do. But I knew baseball was going to be involved. So there was two groups of kids. We had a young group and, a, and an older group. And I split them up. And in the morning, we did the young group, and after I, I did them, uh, Jack said, well, you got to do a Devo. you got to do a devotional. I said, okay, no problem. And then we got through with them, and uh, the older group came in, and we worked with them on fundamentals and different things of, of that nature. And, but after we got done with them, Jack said, you got to do another devotional. I said, okay. And I was wondering in my mind, when is Jack Farber ever going to come into action here and, and pull his weight? But after, after we'd worked with both groups, uh, we had a, a lunch for them, and then we played a game. I divided them up, and we played a game. 
And then the parents were getting ready to come and pick them up and they were all standing out there, I guess just waiting for me and Jack to walk over there. I didn't know exactly what was going on. They were sitting in the stands. And Jack says, you got to do another Devo. <laughs> the parents want to hear a Devo. Now, I wasn't expecting any of this, but yet for some reason I was ready. And the reason is because I'd studied my Bible and I had different things that I was able to communicate with them. But this went on for a solid six days. I had to do three devos a day, so that was 18 devos. And they couldn't, you know, I didn't want them all to be on the same subject, so they had to be on different things. So I was ready, but after the uh, trip was over, I was ready to kill Jack. <laughs> I, I told Jack, I said, Jack, one of these days, I'm going to get you back for that. But I never have. Jack is a great guy, and he will put you on the spot, but he wants you to be ready. But God wants us to be ready also. Parents, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, this is God talking. He said, These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and talk with them. When you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall write them on your doorpost of your house and on your gates. Wow. God's telling us that we need to be ready to be able to understand what His words are so that we can communicate them with other people. And parents, God is telling us as parents, as grandparents, that we need to teach our kids at an early age. We don't need to wait till they're in their teens or even earlier than that or later than that, but we need to teach them from birth. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, it says elders should be apt to teach. That's one of the qualifications for a, a shepherd or an elder or a bishop uh, or a presbyter. All those words are interchangeable. But elders need to be apt to teach. And how are they going to be apt to teach? And they're going to have to study. They're going to have to be able to open up the book and see what it says. And in Titus chapter 2 and verses 3 through 5, and I want to read this one. This is for the older women of, of a congregation. Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips or enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women. You older women are supposed to encourage our younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the Word of God will not be dishonored. Our older women are supposed to teach. We're not, don't think you older women are not supposed to teach because God right here says that you are. You, and you need to be ready to do that. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, this is something that I think we all need to take to heart right here. And it says, Even though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you. Please don't let that ever happen to you. Read the Bible and continue to read it on a daily basis. And it goes on to say this, to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. You know, when we have newborn babies, we need to give them formula, we need to give them milk so that they can grow and later on get onto that solid food. But if you only stay on that milk, you are not growing and you are never, ever going to be ready. And lastly, but, but not leastly, I want us to look at Acts chapter 8, verses 29 through 39. This is Philip. He has been called by the Holy Spirit to go and join himself to a eunuch. This eunuch was the man that took care of the money for the queen of Ethiopia. And he, he was a very intelligent man, but he had come to Jerusalem because he was a Jew to be at a Jewish holiday that all male Jews are supposed to be at it once a year. But on his way back to Ethiopia, 
Philip was called over to his chariot. But the eunuch was reading the Old Testament. He was reading Isaiah chapter 53, and he didn't understand what he was talking, what the, what the Bible was saying. And Philip asked, he said, do you understand what you're reading? And, and the eunuch said, how can I unless someone helps me? So at that point, it says that Philip started preaching unto him Jesus. And we get on down to verse 36, and Philip is continuing to preach to him. But all of a sudden, verse 37 the eunuch makes a statement. And he said, look, here is water. What hindereth me from being baptized? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. All the way through verses 29, all the way up to verse 36, baptism had never, ever been even, not a word of it, it said it even been talked about. But yet here we know that it had been talked about because you, the eunuch brings it up. And then Philip tells him, if you believe that with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, thou mayest. And the eunuch said that he did. And then they went down in the water and the eunuch was baptized the way that the 3,000 people were in Acts chapter 2. But here's the last and final thing that I want to tell you. We need to be ready for either death or for when Jesus Christ comes back the second time. If we're not ready... If we're not a New Testament Christian, having obeyed that gospel plan of salvation, we're not in the situation where we can be ready to go to heaven. And that's what Jesus wants most of all. We can stop a 44-game hitting streak at any time. We can put on Christ and have our sins washed away, as Acts 22, verse 16 tells us. Any time of day. And the preacher here, Zach Collins, and I are ready to study with you at any time. Thank you again for being with a shortstop with a shortstop.